Hey, how's it going? The perfect spot in the afternoon, right? <laughs> People have digested a little bit, but it's still about the beer is away still a little bit and uh, puts in some energy here in the, in the room. Um, I'm Percy. I'm with the company Ubimax. I'm one of the co-founders. I'm responsible for our business here in the Americas. Who's familiar with what Ubimax does? Raise your hand. Okay. So some people don't know what we do. Hopefully after the session it's going to be a little bit more clear. We're focusing on the frontline worker to bring the digital age to these people as well, getting the access to systems, allowing them to communicate in a meaningful way among each other and with experts that are remote, getting them access to the information that they need and allowing them to document whatever they do on the go. So that's kind of what we do. You already had a glimpse at what we do by um, a video you saw earlier, um, the Airbus video that some of you may have seen earlier today. That, that was some of the work that we did. So today I'm here with David from Slumberger. Slumberger is one of our valued com companies that we work with. And uh, I don't want to take up too much of the time. I'd leave most of the time to David because he's going to tell you a little bit more about how they use our solutions and to give you a little bit of hands-on experience. So after the session, hopefully you have a good idea on how to get started. Uh, I think some of the early questions that come up, how to select the hardware, the software, and all of these things. So David's going to talk a little bit about that. And then also what kind of use cases you can do, giving inspiration about stuff they do. Uh, and what is possible. And then also the third thing is about how to really bring an innovation into a company where oftentimes it gets stuck in the innovation departments, but how do you really scale it and bring it into all these different line organizations as well? So it, hopefully we'll learn a little bit about that. And having said that, uh, let's hand it over to David and uh, thank you. Thanks, Percy. So my name is David Redding. I'm the maintenance innovation manager with Slumberger. Uh, Slumberger is an oil and gas service company. And maintenance is something that's very large in our organization. It's something that's maybe overlooked in some, right? So a quick question uh, to interact with you guys. Who all has filled their car up with gas or maybe plugged it into charge? Raise your hand. OK, so most of you have done some type of maintenance, right? How about changing your own oil or changing your, uh, your own tire? Have any of you done that? How about with a checklist? OK, so pretty much every hand went down, right? So when we start to scale this within our organization, so this is handled by a group called Technology Lifecycle Management within Slumberger. Uh, we handle 13 different product lines across the organization. We have over 526 facilities. And our team makes up around 10% of the entire population in Slumberger. So that's a lot of technicians recording maintenance. And on average, we record around 20 million man hours of maintenance per year. And we're responsible for $29 billion worth of assets. And you may ask what an asset is. So this could be everything from a frack pump, so tractor, trailer, drilling rig, um, downhole sensitive electronics, bits, I mean, you name it, we're maintaining all of this, right? But ultimately, what remains important is to deliver those products at the lowest cost, on time, every time, anywhere in the world that we operate. And it's worth mentioning as well, we, we manage the equipment all the way from commercialization all the way until retirement. And so if we look at a workflow like this, we have all these assets, and we have maintenance that takes place in both the field and the shop. Now, you may be asking what a field is, right? But this could be um, anywhere from a, from our you know, wireline crew, some minting crew, um, and some of our you know our rigs. It's all over the place. Um, and in our field, we have a lot of digitally connected sensors, so we know a lot of the stuff about the health of our equipment. But just in the previous conversation, a lot of these checks still have to be done manually, right? So we have to have that operator or technician to do that work, and. Even through you know, digital processes and going to, from you know, hands held to hands free, there's still a lot of checks. And how do you, you know, sift through these? And we have an internal tool called Maintenance Tool. Um, and so we have a large transition from paper over to you know, the tablet devices. We have over 10,000 devices. We record around 1.7 million checks per month. But we still have room for improvement. And this is where the smart glasses comes into play. And again. If you've, if you've looked at this sector here, this is a small subset of the, of the, of the industry, right? And I kind of heard this earlier as well. When you start in this industry, or the, the, the wearable smart glass sector, I call it, we have augmented reality, we have mixed reality, we have assisted reality, virtual reality. Where do you start, right? It's quite overwhelming. And again, Sergey, who's with us from our innovation center, they're doing a lot of things with virtual stuff. But when we talk about maintenance, the virtual reality stuff is not, not really practical, right? 
And as much as we like the cardboard devices for their price tag, it's probably not going to work for use in the oil field, right? And again, we wanted to partner with someone that kind of had a, a strong roadmap and looked for, you know, the device is going to fit our needs for the industrial applications. Some were a little premature. Some simply went out of business, right? And so as we start to kind of dive down this road, um, ultimately we ended up with, with kind of two different use cases. And for me, th when we started this, my idea was to take a device, more augment something so we can see it, and then start to do the maintenance from there. And really the low-hanging fruit is what I call assisted reality, right? And this is where the HMT1, the realware, is just spot on. Um, and from this, we have to then build a software application layer, right? And so this is what kind of, you know, where do you start on that as well? Lots of questions. Um, and again, there's, there's several companies here. A lot of them are here today. Fantastic companies, a lot of, you know, fantastic products. For us, it was important going back to the roadmap, right? We wanted someone that had a, a long vision that we could partner with over the next five, ten years to build a product. And that was also easy for us to start to push out. Um, and again, some were focused on virtual, some were focused on augmented, but we were focused on that, you know, maintenance work construction thing. Um, so we started to, to, to move down, and this is what we ended up with. And again, this is specific for one of our use cases here. There's several going on. Um, an MT on the left is an internal system that I talked about on the previous slide where we start to integrate with our multiple maintenance systems. But the U UBMX platform has been very beneficial to allow us to go from nothing to almost something deployable in, in some cases less than two weeks. It's been very, very, very fast. Um, Percy, you may want to mention on a few of these. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about different use cases that they usually are, and then David's going to provide some actually hands-on experience in going through those. Um, our vision is that a big company, and we usually work for the big companies, they want a solution, they want a platform that they can deploy immediately, have value very fast. You mentioned two weeks, go really into generating value very quickly. But then in the long run, you also don't want to be limited by a point solution that only does a little thing, but you want to have a platform that actually allows you to do everything along the whole supply chain. And that's what we do at, at UBMAX. So we allow you to do logistics work. This is some area that you're not exploring yet. I know that you're looking into it, but uh, a little bit down the road, that may be also something for you. Um, we've been working with other big enterprises in this area. DHL is one of the examples. We just um, started deploying um, with Coke, um, and um, they started in Greece. They plan to scale that to all their uh, different countries that they have their distribution centers in. So that's going to be one of the huge uh, deployments in logistics as well. Um, Slumbergy is very active in the other areas, so for example, in assembly processes. Um, which allows guidance, but also documentation about what you do, which is also important in the maintenance type of work. And that's the area that also the Airbus example from air earlier falls into. So if you need instructions, and you also need that integrated into your backend systems to push that back into your SAP system and make the data available there, then that's what our platform would allow you to do. And then we also have the remote support area. Slumberger is also active there, but there's other companies as well out of the automotive area, for example. BMW is deploying that into all the different dealerships in the US. So it's going to be, if you have a BMW and you get some maintenance done, um, in a few months, all the dealerships will have a device and you will be able to get support if the technician on site is, is not as trained or maybe have a difficult error going into it that they can loop in someone virtually to help them out. So lots of things happening in the area, um, but enough of the abstract stuff. Let's look at the concrete examples here. Continue. So this is, a, uh, this is an example of you I was muted. So what happens here is prior to the equipment leaving the yard, we need to do a certain amount of checks. So we can scan the QR code, pull this in, figure out the pump number, uh, pump type, and then from that we can populate the amount of checks that we need to do on that specific unit. Documents missing? Now you may ask here, he just said something's missing and I may spoil it and say something expired and so How's he going to continue to do those checks, right? And so we'd have some. Expired? Our ecosystem is so broad that we can then send that to a maintenance mechanic or someone on site to then solve that prior to the unit leaving. Secured? Uh, 
So it's usually, if you have use cases like this, it's usually two elements. It's about guidance, to guide them through the checklist, and to also to have Secure. it documented into the backend systems. So right now you're looking at all this. Uh, so this one's jumping into the remote support application we have. Yes, I, I just see that. And yeah, it's been highlighted in green. Yes, that's correct. And that's the right way to install it, but I'm going to show you some pictures over here so you are, you're completely sure and you have installed it correctly. So I'm going to send you some attachments over here. And you have already removed the, the bus disk from, from the discharge port, correct? Yes, that's correct. It's all empty. The old ones are gone. Can you see this picture? Yes, I just see the picture. Yeah, so basically the hole which you see at, it should be at the bottom. Yeah, it's right here. So it's matched. Yeah. Perfect. All right, make sure the expiration date, everything is good on this thing. It's blended, pressure tested. So all the certifications are there and then you're good to go. Perfect, thank you for so I think they're, oh, okay, sorry. So this is manufacturing again. I'll go back and touch on each one of those and give you a little more context in a second. But so on the manufacturing side, not only maintenance, but this can be almost cloned exactly for manufacturing. So I know I talked about our MT thing where we have a lot of, you know, tablet devices are doing these checks, but we also have a lot of stuff that's still done on paper as well. So in manufacturing, we want to look at, if we go from ground zero, we go from our standard paper SWI today to a tablet to a hands-free, what are the results? And they're actually quite, quite stunning. Um, so you can see here a time lapse of the, you know, different technician, same skill level though, right? They go from paper, tablet, and wearable, um, and, and to see the results. And so obviously, hopefully as expected, the wearable finished first, and the guy on the paper here is still chugging along. So if we use the tablet as the base, just because hoping that there's some digital transformation there, uh, we saw a 15% increase just from going from the handheld to the hands-free. Um, and not surprisingly, you know, the paper was about 88% slower. But what was more surprisingly was that when they did it with paper, they missed things such as a strap on their arm for uh, electrical discharge, missed uh, tooling help and demonstration, right? So not only did it take them longer, but they also had service quality issues. And so in kind of summary on what we're doing at Slumberjay on our pilot projects, um, we have multiple project lines, we have multiple things that we're doing. And the reason that you only see remote support and training at the bottom is because when we started this, this was kind of more of the, all right, these are out of the box, this is, you know, let's go for something farther. But these have come to be proven to be very, very beneficial, right? In fact, the remote support stuff is, is, is expanding rapidly. Uh, and same with training. I almost think of this as like hands-free YouTube, right? The guys are actually able to watch a video of, of building something, whether it's manufacturing or maintenance, and they can see that real time on the device completely hands-free, right? And of course, HSC is a big one for us. So now we're moving from something handheld to hands-free. So we're not having to take off our gloves to do the, to do the maintenance. Um, and also quality and compliance. Again, like I just mentioned, we're not missing steps. Uh, we're not missing, you know, part of the process that's very, very important. And also compliance. So now we can systematically force them to do the checks in the manner that we want to do them. So if, for example, you take a pump, a pump truck. Instead of going all around the unit, now we can have them start from the roadside you know, radiator, for example, and go around in the order that the checks are coming in. But the big one that we saw was the efficiency. So again, just from the maintenance side, we saw around 33% efficiency gain. And we can translate this into financial dollars internally, right? Um, but that's going from you know, the handheld to the hands-free. And so then we come to this, right, as to where do you start, where are you, and where are you getting to? And for us, you know, we have several projects going on. You know, we're starting to, to move between two and three, where we start to move beyond those pilot phases and more to, you know, actual rollout and deployments. I think something really important to, to note here is I spent six years in the field as a wireline field engineer. Um, so the guy getting sprayed in the face, I mean, it's kind of funny to get through the water holes, but we live through that every day, right? And I think what's most important is we took the device to our guys in the field before we even built anything. Because it's so important that if they don't want to use that, guess what? they're not going to use it, right? So it's so important to make sure you have that adaptation first and foremost, or at least it was for us, right? So um, I don't know if you have any comments on, the, on some of the journey or? Yeah, I think what is important to, to know is um, that a lot of companies, they do have challenges in moving from their 
early stage exposure to new, te new technology, especially out of the innovation areas, into actually putting it into productive use. And I think most of the companies fail here. They have innovation departments that are very disconnected what is actually going on in the rest of the company. And that's not true for Slumberger. They're doing a fantastic job, and I really have to say that, that both David, but also Sergey, who's also here today, they're doing an extremely good job to identify new technology, to identify also the stakeholders in the company who can benefit from that, and expose them to it, and then allowing them to really take it into production. So for Slumberger, this is not a very disconnected world, like for most of the companies it is, but it's rather really the, the first step in, in putting it into a, a global rollout really here. And that's unique, that's, that's a lot of times it's the problem. When we get approached and it's innovation departments, we are, oh no, it's already dead. So <laughs> that's a, sometimes the reaction. Um, so we, we'd rather speak to someone who actually sees the benefit in his daily job and then adopts it for these reasons. And these benefits are usually, it's faster, it's usually also more accurate. You talked about that. You have compliance aspects usually to that. You have safety aspects to it. And one thing that we didn't talk about yet is also becoming a truly digital enterprise. So when you have rolled that out to a large number of people, and we, we all agree that we as humans will be part of also the future work processes, the question is how do we adapt to a changing environment and to changing requirements if we are still relying on paper or technology like PowerPoints that are so static. But when you adopt technology like this, you can digitize work processes and you can also adapt them at the speed that you need to be for, for being an agile enterprise. And that's one of the big game changers that we will see. So the companies that are adopting that now, like Slumberger, they will have an immediate benefit um, in, in a pretty big range, depending on what technology they use today. We saw it's about 15% faster than tablet in this process. I believe you shared some numbers earlier in the other processes that may be even, even higher. And then if you're still using paper, you're obviously off the chart, right? Yep. Um, so you will have some immediate benefit or, or kind of uh, a disadvantage towards your competition if you don't do it. But then there's going to be the second hit when you actually are faced with needing to change. A company like Slumberger would be able to immediately adapt work processes, publish them, roll them out to the, all of the employees and change their ways of working, whereas all the other companies that are not doing that would be stuck in, in the ways that they do and have a lot, much longer time to respond to that. So that's, that's what I wanted to add here. I think, do you, do you have any additional comments? Okay. We're almost up, but maybe there's time for yeah. one or two questions if you have. A minute and a half on questions. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll be around if you guys want to stop us and, and discuss anything. So, Sounds good. We give you back one and a half minutes then. <laughs>